So there's a sutta about the five hindrances called the Sangharavo Sutta in the Connected Discourses. Imagine, Brahman, there was a bowl of water filled with lac, turmeric, indigo, or crimson dye so that one looking into that bowl could not see their face clearly. Even so, when one dwells with a mind overcome with kamachanda, sensual desire, then one cannot see clearly what is for what one's own benefit and others' benefit, and even sacred words long known to one are unclear. Imagine, Brahman, a bowl of water boiling over fire, bubbling, so that one could not see the reflection of one's face clearly. Even so, when one dwells with a mind overcome with ill will, ill will, vayapada, one cannot see clearly what's for one's own benefit or for others. And even sacred words long known to one are unclear. Imagine, Brahman, a bowl of water overgrown with algae and water plants so that one could not see one's face clearly. Even so, when one dwells with an, a mind overcome by sloth and torpor, tinamita, one cannot see clearly what's for one's own or other's benefit, and sacred words long known to one are unclear. Imagine Brahman a bowl of water ruffled by the wind so that it eddied and stirred, and one could not see one's face clearly. Even so, when one dwells with a mind overcome by restlessness and remorse, uddacca kukucha, one cannot see clearly what's for one's own or other's benefit, and sacred words long known to one are unclear. Imagine Brahman, a bowl of water, stirred up, muddied, set in a dark place, so that one could not see one's face clearly. Even so, when one dwells with a mind overcome by skeptical doubt, vichagicha, one cannot see clearly what's for one's own benefit or others, and sacred words long known to one are unclear. Imagine, Brahman, a bowl of clear water set in the open still, so that one looking into it could see clearly one's face. Even so, when one dwells with a mind free of sensual desire, of ill will, of sloth and torpor, of restlessness and remorse, of skeptical doubt, then one can see clearly what's for one's own benefit and the benefit of others, and sacred words even just learned are clear. I love those five analogies. And Last week, we spoke about the radiant mind, the fact that the Buddha said, the mind is luminous. It is only tainted by passing defilements. Pabasarang uh, chittang, radiant mind, akandukehi kilesehi, visiting defilements. And the idea that the more you strip away the accumulation and crust which has grown on our hearts over years and lifetimes, the more you come to a simple, clean, radiant heart. And it could be said that maybe 70% of the practice in the beginning is just watching the chitta grow brighter and brighter. But these visiting defilements are real. The enlightened mind is able to not take them up. And yet, most of us do pick up the anger. We do pick up the sensual desire. We do pick up the sloth and torpor, the skeptical doubt, the restlessness and remorse. 
Jack Cornfield has a saying where he says, if you can exist something like, if you can exist happily with those in your life every day, if you can eat contentedly whatever's put in front of you, if you can sleep without a pill or a drink every night, if you can watch your neighbors go off to a fun vacation without jealousy, then you're probably a dog. <laughs> so understanding that our bar is where we are. We're half demon, half animal. Well, we're half animal and half uh, angel. And acknowledging that both are at play. And the Buddhist word for goodness at least in one context, is kusala, which means skillful. And etymologically, it's related to the word for kusa grass. And kusa grass is a very sharp grass in India. And to pick it, you have to be very skillful to not cut yourself. And so kusala is our skill in practice. I referenced the quote last week that if you want to teach people to sail, don't teach them to build the ship, but teach them to love the ocean. But actually, that in one of the profound strengths of this lineage and teaching is its practicality of skill. How do we build the ship? And though the Buddha spoke of root defilements in the heart, greed, hatred, and delusion, the five practical manifestations of those that he said kept us from calm day in and day out, that obscured the mind from settling into radiance are the five hindrances. These are the guests that we meet when we sit down and close our eyes. These are the bowls of water that we find ourselves staring and squinting at, trying to see our face. So these also are the core of the fourth foundation of mindfulness. When you take extant versions and compare them the core teachings that seem to have been at the heart of that foundation of mindfulness are the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. These bright, these dark and bright mental qualities that we learn to balance and learn how to abandon the hindrances. So these are a practical skill. Someone once asked Ajahn Chah, when I'm meditating and my mind strays from its object. How do I know whether to investigate that object further or just to return to uh, that distraction further or just to return to my main meditation object? And Longpur Cha said, it's like you live in a little village and you walk past these people on the street and maybe it's a distraction comes up or an old argument you've had or a craving you know well or a mind state and it's someone you've seen a thousand times walking down the street. And in which case, it's fine just to give them a little wave and walk on. You just acknowledge, know it, and then return to your object of meditation. But maybe it's a new character on the street. Or maybe it's looking especially deranged. Or maybe it grabs onto your arm and won't let you go. And in those cases, when the fantasy keeps coming up, when you feel the anger take up residence in your body, when you can't return to the breath or the metta meditation, then it's okay to turn to that object and either apply an antidote, which we'll discuss, or investigate, learn the causality behind the hindrance. What's causing it? Where is this anger coming from? Where is this greed originating in? And three really useful ways of walking down this street of our day-to-day -day lives and minds um, and encountering such passing defilements, the visiting defilements, the hindrances. Uh, one that gets not as much attention as it should and deserves to be held up again and again is just noting uh, Jnana Ponika said that, uh, he's a famous monk, said that one of the functions of mindfulness is to put things in order by naming them. 
And just the act of naming a hindrance does so much. It's known. It's like children playing under the staircase in the dark. And when the parent opens up the door and turns on the light and just stares at them, things are a lot less fun for those kids, and they stop playing. So often, and this is a really powerful skill in daily life, can you just say anger, anger, greed, doubt, sloth, tiredness, restlessness. And just that act of naming it settles the mind. It lets you put things into perspective. It lets you uh, make it into an object rather than something you're identified with. So noting practice is very powerful. And that's just like passing someone on the street and you say, hi, John, how are you doing? And then you just keep walking. The other means that's very useful is the Buddha spoke about the gratification pentad, actually, uh, sometimes triad and sometimes pentad. And that's the idea that to let go of any state, any unwholesome mental quality, you should understand its arising, its ceasing, its attraction, its drawback, and its escape. So first, just noticing how these hindrances arise uh, in daily life and meditation. What stirs up greed for you? What brings anger into being? And can you avoid those things? Maybe there's a particular kind of news cycle that really gets you. Can you steer away from that? Maybe there's a certain food that really stirs you up. Uh, can you steer away from that? Um, maybe there's times of day when you're more tired than others. Can you learn to meditate at different points or put on a Dharma talk? Just the simple fact of what brings, what is the cause and ground for these states? But then also to see in each of these defilements instances, the drawback, the attraction, and the escape. So with greed, kamachanda, sensual desire, the attraction is obvious. Uh, it's, it's, there's a flush to desire. Um, but what's the drawback? Can you, in a meditation, when the fantasy comes up of the movie or the addiction or the whatever it is you're looking forward to, can you really consider um, What's the drawback of this? How soon, how many seconds does that mouthful of food last before it disappears, um, before it's nothing else, um, or before that experience is gone? Um, with, uh, can you look at the drawback in terms of just the suffering of obsessing about a sensual pleasure? Uh, the Buddha said that fixation on sensual pleasures is our proclivity towards them, meaning that we don't really care about the pizza. What we care about is fantasizing about the pizza. And to notice that, there's a certain way your mind kind of gnaws at that bone. And the Buddha uses that analogy. A dog gnawing at a... Sensual desires are like a dog gnawing at a stripped bone. And really, all the dog is tasting is its own saliva. You know, that's what we are kind of getting by on. And you know those fantasies you've been through a hundred times. And really, at this point, it's just your own saliva. Um, and can you really ask yourself, like, would I pay five dollars to see this movie again? And to notice also that the, um, to recollect death when sensual desire comes into meditation, how precious is this moment? How long do we really have? We don't know, and do you really want to waste another 10 minutes of the meditation thinking about the next Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, or the last one? You know, how precious is this moment, and what do you want to use it for? And that can be as simple as a long recollection of the fact that you will die, or a very quick phrase, you will die, now is all you have, now is all you have. And just let that sword of wisdom cut off the desire, the sensual desire. You can think about what the food will become in about 10 hours. Um, 
my mom was once cooking at Servasti Abbey for the nuns there and was getting really concerned about getting the right dish for them. And one of the nuns just came up and she said, Sarah, in 10 minutes, this is all just going to be crap anyways. And it was such a relief, you know. And it sounds a little bit distasteful, but it's just the full picture. Like, how obsessed do we really have to be about this particular dish when, in a second, just chew it up and spit it back onto your plate and see how attractive it is? It's that, that distance from being not attractive. And if you're really intent on this practice, you can actually, after you've kind of used the toilet, just take a look. Take a look. It's not that crazy. Um, you're just seeing truth. That's all. Another thing is just to use the Four Noble Truths and label dukkha, dukkha. Label suffering, suffering. When you've obsessed about the donut or the hit of weed or whatever it is, again and again, and you just can't rip your mind from it, can you see the hot burning sensation of suffering and just label kamachanda, sensual desire for what it is? It's suffering. The Buddha said that even as a leper would gain a measure of satisfaction from picking off his scabs over a fire. Apparently that is something lepers did, I guess. But we all know that kind of compulsive satisfaction of picking a scab. The Buddha compared that to sensual desire. You pick the scab again and again. And he compared sensual desire to going into debt. And because of the hedonic treadmill, because the next serotonin burst from the sensual stimulus will never be as good as the initial one, we always find we're taking out new debts to pay off the old. We're always giving our hearts to things that will end. So there's something to be said for seeing the drawback in all these ways and letting go of them through that. And um, cultivating an internal source of pleasure, you have to let that flush of sensual desire die down, let it move through the body. And sometimes there's a moment of dryness and desolation after that because you have to let that pattern fade. But then if you hold still through that, if you cultivate skill and meditation and these internal wellsprings of non-sensual happiness like loving kindness, a sense of genuine self-worth from metta, uh, from morality, giving, community, love, then instead of feeding off of the world, you find pleasure in giving to the world and blessing it. And that's the new health food. You replace that kind of binging on Cheetos for, I, I don't know where that analogy goes from there, but you stop eating Cheetos. <laughs> um, or at least the flaming hot Cheetos and then switch to normal or something. So it's not, you know, all these hindrances are understandable. There's no reason to feel great guilt over them, but you don't, there's work to be done. And we've spent enough time circling around the same old things. And where has it gotten us? The next um, hindrance is ill will, which the Buddha compared to the boiling bowl of water or a sickness. And the drawback of ill will is easy to see, it's painful. It's a sickness. It weakens the body, makes one unwilling to eat, etc. But what's the attraction? Why do we keep coming back to it? And to note that flush of self-righteous uh, sense of solidity in the self. There's no drug almost as seductive as self-righteous anger. And once again, in 2024's election cycle, let's keep that in mind. But to notice that the Buddha spoke about kama tanha, craving for sensuality, but he also spoke about bhava tanha, craving to become. And we like the feeling of being solid, of knowing where we are and that we're right and powerful. And anger gives that sense of flush. But in the Buddha's words, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root, like spreading it's like spreading honey on a blade of a knife. You know the sense of diving into it, and you know the pain that comes afterwards. So yes, you can just name anger, but you can also apply the antidote of loving kindness. 
or you can investigate back what is it about a situation or a person that's bringing up aversion in you. Often the things we're most averse to are the things that are inside ourselves that we see in others. What is it that we're projecting? And can we also recollect that the people in our lives who most irritate us are often the only place where we really have the chance to practice goodwill and patience. We know we need to come to a place where we can exist in the same country as a person who has a different opinion than us. And the only way we're gonna do that is by existing in a country where other people have different opinions than us. So it's quite a gift that we exist in a country where people have different opinions than us and a family and what a gift that we get to practice because we know we have to overcome that barrier at some point. So whenever you're at the dinner table with those relatives that are being especially difficult or encountering the coworker that doesn't agree with you, can you really bow to them? Maybe not in person, although you could try, but can you really bow to them and just say, thank you for giving me a chance to move through this essential aspect of my practice. We have a member here who designated their teddy bear as Vladimir Putin for a whole year and had it on the next uh, shrine, uh, the, the um, second level of their shrine shelf. Uh, doesn't have to be on the top level, but you can put someone there. The next hindrance the Buddha spoke about is tinamita, sloth and drowsiness algae, or the Buddha compared it to a dungeon. And just this, this is common. And the Buddha, in one sutta, speaks to Mahamogalana, one of the most prominent disciples, who's nodding off, which is comforting, because this is the second most prominent disciple before he was an arhant, and he also nodded off, so you're in good company. And he's nodding off, and suddenly the Buddha appears, manifests out of nowhere, which would be would definitely wake you up. And he says, Maha Mogalana, are you, are you nodding? And uh, Ma Mogalana says, yes, yes, Lord. And he says, whatever object you are attending to while nodding off, turn attention to something else. And by that means, drowsiness may be dispelled. So replacing one object with another. The breath is very calming. So if you're nodding off, can you replace that with the sound of silence or the perception of light or loving kindness? or an active body scan? Can you walk meditation? Can you open the eyes just a little bit? Or you can place a rock or some object between your thumbs in a mudra, and when it drops, you'll know that you've slipped off. Uh, Ajahn Brahm has a story that when he was at a monastery with Longpur Cha, they made all the monks put candle uh, matchboxes on their heads so that if they nodded off the matchbox would fall on the floor and wake them up and Ajahn Brahm said he woke up when he he figured out that he could use a piece of gum to stick it to his head <laughs> and then one day he found himself suddenly woken up by a really loud noise and he realized it was the sound of his head hitting the floor <laughs> so so don't do that <laughs> the Buddha then says if that doesn't work Recollect the Dharma as you have heard and memorized it, and by this means, your drowsiness may be dispelled. So can you memorize a verse of Dhamma or teachings you've heard? Uh, if you haven't memorized the first turning of the wheel of Dhamma, the Dhamma Chaka Bhavatana Sutta, there's nothing more worth memorizing in the world. Uh, the Bhikkhu Bodhi says those are the most profound words ever utter uttered by a human being. Granted, we're biased, we're monks, but I think it's true. If that doesn't work, Mogalana, recite out loud the Dhamma as you have heard and memorized it. So to say it out loud, to chant, or if you know one chant, like the loving kindness chant, the Karani and Metta Sutta, these are in the chanting books. Just chant that out loud. If that doesn't work, uh, stand up and look. Uh, no, no, stand and look to the perception of light. So can you bring to mind the perception of daytime? And then he says, if that doesn't work, stand and establishing a path, walk back and forth 
So this is walking meditation. And if that doesn't work, lie down mindfully on your right side in lion's posture, determined to get just enough rest and to wake up mindfully. So I find actually that's really helpful. If you're really drowsy, take a four-minute power nap. Just set your alarm for four minutes and let yourself lie down. And sometimes your mind will kind of bounce down and up, and you'll find yourself quite calm. And I would add cold showers to this. The Buddha didn't say that, but I think it's really helpful. Cold water will wake you up. But to notice also sometimes, because of scale and variance, each of these patterns are ones that you can see in your meditation, but you'll also often find scale invariance is the feature of a chaotic system where a pattern will repeat on a microcosmic level and a macrocosmic level, the small and the wide. So you might notice that these same patterns are the ones that dominate your lives. And just as you lean into sloth and torpor in a meditation, maybe you find that the way you deal with your struggling marriage is just by turning out, tuning out. Or maybe with sensual desire, you find that the way that you, just as you distract yourself from a boring meditation with a thought of the next meal, maybe you're always thinking of the next vacation to keep yourself from looking at how difficult and unpleasant your job is right now. Make those connections and understand these hindrances are not trifling things. These dominate our lives. They have us in our, their clutches. And if we can gain understanding of them and antidotes to them on the cushion, then we soften the pattern and dispel it in the wider scope of our lives as a whole. The fourth hindrance, udacca kukucha, which is very fun to say, is restlessness and remorse. Remorse, regret over the past. Anxiety and restlessness, anxiety over the future. So first, to, rec you know, to note it, and then to recollect death again. How, uh, how long do we have? And is it really worth thinking about the past and future? And with regret, this is such a burden for people in their lives. And to know that the Buddha said that one who dwells in guilt, thinking they'll go to hell for an action, that will drag their heart down. And in the Connected Discourses, one sutta called the Conch Blower, he says, with an act that one regrets, one should think, that was not good, and I'm not proud of what I have done. But what is done is done. Even as a Conch Blower would make themselves heard to the north, south, east, and west, even so, when one has developed the mind imbued and widened with loving kindness, with compassion, with sympathetic joy, and with equanimity, the four Brahmaviharas, the four states of loving kindness, then any limited action does not persist there. He has another analogy where he says, when a negative action manifests in the constricted mind, it's like a pinch of salt mixed into a glass of water and it changes the taste to one of all salt. But if that same negative action's karma, fruit of karma, manifests in this broad mind of loving kindness, then it's like a pinch of salt mixed into the Ganges River, and it doesn't affect the taste almost at all. So he's acknowledging, yes, there are these deeds we've all done, we've all messed up, how could we have known better at the time? But that if we cultivate the broad, beautiful mind now, then those things can just dissipate. And to expect, you know, my parents compare coming to retreat or meditation to driving in a car and suddenly stopping and all your baggage comes and hits you in the back of the head. And this is why people don't meditate is because there's a lot of baggage waiting in the back seat. But can you have patience when you sit and let that stuff bleed out of you? Let that grieving process happen let the stuff come up and have patience with that process and not circle in on remorse, r regret. There's wholesome remorse of knowing that an action was beneath us, but we don't, guilt, the Buddha said, is never wholesome in the sense of self-recrimination, self-flagellation. Can we have metta for ourselves for not knowing more than we knew when we knew it? 
Self-forgiveness is having respect for our own conditionality. How could we have known better then? And to know that we're doing okay, if you've come to this path, even if you've messed up, there's times, disciples in the Buddhist times who are mass murderers, they still contain awakening. No one's beyond redemption. And just to have patience with that process with yourself, the healing takes a long time. But if you've come to this practice, this path, even if you've messed up in the past, even if your samadhi isn't that great, if you have right view and morality, if you have community, this is one of the most significant things that can happen in a life. You're doing, likely, you're doing okay if you've come this far. And there's more to be done, but at least have some sense of forgiveness for yourself. And as to the future, anxiety, just the acknowledgement that we can't know what's to come, that any hovering over such things is based on delusion because it's a fantasy. And what we do know is what makes us feel strong in the moment and what makes us feel anxious and weak going forward. And the strong action, the one that makes you feel integrated rather than disintegrated, this is the action we take as Buddhists. Intention is the primary element of kama. And when the storm is fiercest, when the seas are highest, we're tempted to look out and try to get everything in order, to look to the horizon and know exactly what we should do. But those are also the moments when the, the waves are so high that all you often can do is actually just look to the feeling in your own heart of an action. All you can do is steer into the next wave and make sure you don't capsize. So when you're really anxious and worried about the next week or month or year, can you just say, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do this week and just put one foot in front of another until the storm blows over and clarity emerges. The Buddha compared moving out of restlessness and remorse to that bowl of water ruffled by the wind calming and to one escaping slavery. And the fifth of skeptical doubt isn't a wholesome investigation, which the Buddha would encourage, but rather that doubt that makes us chase our tails around and around again and again. And to see that there's no way past doubt through doubt, not that kind. And so when doubt arises to return to your main meditation object, your home base, until things calm down and you can see clearly, to label it as doubt and know that you're not going to get anywhere by engaging with it. And finally, it's really helpful to have a, well, you could say, what would Jesus do? But we uh, often take a teacher you know and just say, what would that person do? So Long Porpasano's Ajahn Kovilo and my, one of my art chief teachers, and our acronym is LL, uh, WWLPPD. Long Porpasano, no, LPPD, yes. What would Long Porpasano do? So just after a time, you can kind of imagine them what they would say to you. And sometimes it's a very clear, stop it, you know, something like that. And just to bring that to mind, you have good references now. And if that's not enough, then just call a teacher, talk to a Kali and Amitta, a spiritual friend, and find a way past out. So the Buddha said, when these five hindrances are giving, given up, and he said, even so, bhikkhus, a practitioner considers the mind overcome with the five hindrances to be a debt, a sickness, a prison, slavery, passage through des desolate land. I forgot to mention that's doubt is a passage through thief-infested wilderness. The mind free of these five hindrances is freedom from debt, freedom from illness, freedom from a dungeon, freedom from slavery, safe passage. The mind, when the hindrances go into abeyance, becomes glad. The glad mind becomes rapturous. The rapturous mind becomes tranquil. The tranquil mind becomes unified. The unified mind sees clearly. The clear mind gains liberation and knowledge and vision of liberation. 
พันธมยังธรรมคาถายาสาธุปการังตถามาเซสาธุสาธุสาธุอนุโมทามิ So we have time for some questions or discussion. If people want to ask anything or bring up a topic, just raise your hand, and we'll run a mic over to you. If you're on Zoom, you can type your question into the chat or raise your electronic hand. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Sean. I had a quick question about um, sloth and torpor, and um, a lot of the examples you give have to do with meditation and keeping wakefulness during meditation. But um, Trying to think of, I was trying to like settle into an understanding of what the message is in the context of a society where we're hyper productive and often pushing ourselves, you know, pretty hard, um, and not in the way of like, well, you should scale back, get more rest, so you can be more mindful. Not in that sense, but how do we um, negotiate? Um, Having a little hard time putting into words. How do we negotiate this idea of being wakeful and bright-minded with with also the want to strive and push our bodies and negotiating that between those two things? Because you know, obviously, we can strive in meditation too. So, how do we know the difference? Thank you. Good question. It's a mistake to think of meditation as the cultivation of a technique, and Ajahn Jaya Saro says it's much more accurately thought of as a life skill development session. And one of those really key life skills is what does right effort look like to cultivate wholesome states, to abandon unwholesome states, um, all four actually. But we don't have a good picture of right effort in our culture. Just the word strive, like what it. What a word, you know. And there's times where it could be said in a wholesome sense, but um, but what meditation allows is the feedback is immediate. If you're pushing too hard, then you clench up very quickly, and you cut off, you kink up the pipes to the inner wellspring, or you find that the aversive mindset that you've used to kind of flagellate yourself into action for much of your life. It actually burns and leads to a certain exhaustion of its own, a hangover. Even if in the moment it provides short-term energy, it's a dirty, burning fuel. And simultaneously, you begin to access these deeper wellsprings of energy in the body, which are much cleaner, burning fuel. Um, you know, you notice that when you approach the mind. And meditation with a gentle invitation, like what sort of breath would feel good right now, something like that, that the body and mind respond naturally, and there's a lot of energy hidden there, but it's not the same sort of energy. And I'd say that same kind of lesson and right effort—it just takes a long time to learn. Um, But as we do learn to sit every day and feel the hangovers, quote unquote, of when we apply energy unwholesomely or unskillfully or right wrong effort, the lesson does sink in. And I'd say, you know, really finding the skillful means of metta is a huge wellspring of loving of of energy. Um, when people. Uh, Try to maintain mindfulness in the day over with a object such as the breath. Often it's a very fragile balance, and you know you can really be thrown off by a difficult coworker or too much work or whatever. But loving kindness, and if you can really reframe each task as many as you're able in terms of how can I make this a gift to these beings? Like how can I alleviate suffering in this moment? How can I listen carefully? Then, if you can bring metta as an undergirding to 
all this other activity, there's this sustaining, powerful wellspring of energy ready there. And then when you sit to meditate, you don't find there's the same residue. And David Stendhal Rost said, the cure to exhaustion isn't rest, but wholeheartedness. And I find that if there's that reframing of a lot of our activity with loving kindness and as a gift, um, then we can be wholehearted about almost anything, not anything, but um, I find that helpful. But I find that, you know, practical means to doing that are find 10 minutes in your lunch break to have a meditation session and reestablish mindfulness. If you have a regular task at work, like going to the water cooler or filling up a pitcher of water um, as a waiter, can you take three breaths and just reestablish mindfulness at that point to just reorient? Can you have a mala bead in your pocket that you kind of recite when the time comes? Um, so I think all those can be useful, um, but also acknowledge, like having some compassion for ourselves existing in this society where, you know, not much of society's structured to take care of our meditation practice for us. And it's just going to be hard to, you know, like you can expect to emerge from most days slightly traumatized in your own way, probably. So um, how did all that kind of land? Any thoughts? What have you found? Oh, uh, I guess I don't. I guess it's just really trying to understand just the teaching a little more. But thank you for that. And one day a week of, uh, of meditation and you post it today really reorients and rejuvenates. So I think that is worth a lot too. And if you're at a desk trying to get a standing or a walking desk or something like a, a treadmill or just not, sitting's not great for us. So that actually really helps me access energy when I'm not sitting all the time. I'm thinking about uh, what you said about how we're half animal and half angel. And not exactly sure what my question is, but it's something about our relationship with the animal part. Um, I know for myself, it's really hard to accept that part of me. And uh, I'm wondering something about, as a person progresses you know, along the Eightfold Path, what happens to the animal part? Is it still there and or how does our relationship with that part of ourselves change? I think you're not alone in having trouble accepting it. Um, particularly anger. We, we don't realize how angry we are, I think, most of us. Um, often at a monastery for the first few months, people will have a ton of greed come up. I thought about StarCraft too for like three months. <laughs> I never even played that game. Um, and then anger comes. And often that aversive phase can last about five years. And the person sitting next to you is responsible for half the world's suffering. We're all very sick. And um, yeah, that's frustrating. Um, and I'd say that like as one practices, um, the manifestations of those anger, uh, of the animal part, become much more refined. You know, in some sense, they're not even, quote unquote, an animal anymore. Maybe we're just a little bit sharp with someone in our speech, or maybe we exaggerate a little bit. But it begins to feel just as bad in that moment. Or, or like we sense the cloth is cleaner so that any stain really shows up still. And it can really still shake you, uh, and not in a bad, bad way, like you don't want to hold on to it, but there's always the balance of the first two and the second two noble truths. Um, the first two being dukkha and its cause, and the second two being peace, the cessation of dukkha and its path. And we can expect there to be a pretty even balance of like, the practice will be happy about 50% of the time, or like pretty onward leading, and then it's going to kind of suck for about 50% of the time. And suck in the sense that we'll have to deal with suffering and look at the, the darker parts of ourselves and the parts that are imperfect. And what I find really important in practice is being nimble enough to know when to make the transition. Because we have no problem 
resting in the third and fourth noble truth. When things are peaceful and the path is moving smoothly and we're coming out of retreat, it's easy. The difficulty is when inevitably the pendulum swings and we find ourselves looking at our, our, our darker side again. And if we are insistent on remaining in that good, bright place and not looking at that, then it can be really discordant. But if we know, okay, like this is my chance to be humble, to look carefully at what's not yet beautiful in me and not to, you know, just to forgive myself and to kind of keep my head, just keep your head down, keep putting one foot in front of the other and expect a storm a little bit. Um, if you manage to make that turn into the first and second noble truth again, where your duty is to comprehend dukkha, then it, it, you can move through it with grace. But uh, that transition's hard. People never want to do it, and we always miss it, you know? So I think that's, that's the real secret, is knowing when to turn back into those first and second noble truths.